My name is Daniel Kalni. I'm from the Czech Republic. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the fourth day, again and first time. Again presenting another project with uh, using green race chips, and first time doing so in person. So I will be talking about the project inspired by bats. And first, let me start with a short movie. When I watch a video like this, I always wonder how those little fellows can navigate in such a cluttered environment, and seemingly effortlessly they avoid hitting each other. And I have the same feeling, I have the same feeling when I see this bird hunting an insect and localizing it just using ultrasonic chirps and listening to its own echoes. So I think bats are amazing animals, and so is their echolocation ability. So it's not surprising that sonar has found use in many military and civil applications, and sonar is bio-inspired. And it is also one of the favorite uh, proximity detectors in mobile robotics, where it's often used in this configuration of many sensors around the robot measuring distance to the closest obstacle. Yet scientists have yet to discover a creature like this with a ring of ears around its head. <laughs> and I was wondering whether we can create robots that navigate exactly like that, using just two ears. Well, I'm not the only one who is wondering. There's a intensive research in this field focusing on behavior and uh, physiology of echolocating bats. There are people designing VLSI chips that mimic neural circuitry of bats, and many other people who simply explore new technology that are very inspired. And I was following that research for some time, wondering how greener chips could be used in these applications, and what would be the advantage of using greener chips. And then I came across a paper by Michael Kuhlman and Kate McRoberts uh, entitled Bad Inspired Robot Navigation. And I said, well, that's it. So I, re I read the paper, and actually it's a technical report about their undergraduate summer project. And they clearly describe how this works. So briefly, you have to send an ultrasonic pulse, and the, the objects reflect the waves, and those wave are, waves are detected by two microphones that are slanted. And the recorded sound waves are then processed with this filter, the digital filter, and you extract the amplitude envelope. And using first derivative, you just find maxima on those amplitude envelopes. And what is, what is nice about that, that if you calculate the ratio of these amplitudes from left and right channel, you can estimate the angle to the object. And of course, time of flight is uh, proportional to the distance. However, this approach has several drawbacks. First, the filter has to be really good, because otherwise you end up with those little bumps, and first derivative can misinterpret them as peaks. And second, first derivative is not capable of distinguishing between strongly overlapping overlapping peaks. It will just find one maximum. So in my project, I wanted to implement binaural obstacle detection in green arrays chips, but to use a different mathematical approach to overcome those limitations. And when I started the project, I also wanted not to be limited to one chip, so it's a multi-chip application, and definitely I wanted to enjoy that. Uh, there is a little hardware that I need, and is, as in all my projects, it's a minimal hardware. So in this case, the setup looks like this. I have a head with ultrasonic transducers connected to uh, an analog module. This is essentially, um, there are signal amplifiers. And then this is connected to green array evaluation board. All processing takes place in those two chips. And then I have ColorForce application in uh, just in its notebook, and I use it to visualize the results. 
for people who don't see this table, it looks something like that. So this is the head, this is the analog module, there's a green that is above water. The ultrasonic transducers have 40 kilohertz frequency and uh, the, the beam angle is approximately 60 degrees and that's also the angle between the two receivers. The transmitter amplifier uses the very well known LN386. This is the circuit taken from data sheet. I have just this uh, resistor. This is a load resistor for, for green arrays uh, DAC. The receiver amplifier is based on LNV640 that's a quad CMOS uh, of amp, and I use this uh, two-stage inverting amplifiers. It is uh, one power supply, 1.8 volts, and I have a divider to send the virtual to 750 millivolts. It's not a midpoint of the power supply, and you will see in a few minutes why I've chosen this volume. I think that all applications that use greener is chips they need a good floor plan. So we will start also with a floor plan. That's the floor plan of the whole application uh, in both chips. And I will talk shortly about those modules uh, and I will follow roughly the, the signal path. So first in target chip there's a clock generator and this is the chunk design uh, clock using 10 MHz ceramic resonator. I just divide this frequency to 1 MHz and distributed via external lines to analog nodes. Then there's a pin generator. This small module is connected with uh, analog output to ultrasonic transmitter, and it generates these sine waves. Then there are two uh, echo recording modules where the analog input of those analog nodes are connected to uh, receivers. And the, the task of this, of this module is to listen to the analog input, and the output is digitized amplitude envelope. Now there are, oh, that's an application trigger. For this demo, I start the application from, from the Colorful uh, program. It sends a signal, and it's distributed to uh, the transmitter, and it, it starts also the action in those receivers. The amplitude envelopes are then processed in those two huge modules, and this is the heart of the application, where in the input there's an amplitude envelope, and the output is position and intensity of peaks in left and right channel. And these data are combined just in one stream and sent via surface line to the host chip, where again both channels are treated separately. There's done some post processing. Essentially, I'm, I'm ordering the data in the way that I can combine them. This matchmaker module then have a, has a look at peaks from left and right channel and it finds the corresponding piece, peaks that correspond to one object. And the last is the node that just calculates the azimuth to the, the objects and the whole data set is sent back to the computer to, to display the result. The implementation section of my talk will have three parts and at the end of each part I will show a little demonstration of how this particular module works. But due to time limitations, I won't be able to show the code of most nodes. However, uh, this slide will be posted on SBFIC uh, website together with slides uh, containing the code. So if you are interested and read it, just have any questions, just send me an email and I'll be happy to answer. So I will start with this part, pink generator and echo recording. Pink generator generates 40 kilohertz sine burst. Currently, I use three cycles as an impulse. And it's based on clocked DAC. How it works? In this node, I have a table of 50 values that, when converted to voltage, they generate this sine wave. And those 50 values are consecutively sent to the other node. And the analog node does the conversion, but it's clocked. So it does conversion on, on rising and falling edge of the clock. So that's 500 nanoseconds interval multiplied by 50, and you have 25 microseconds, which is 
time interval for 40 kilohertz signal. This is very simple. However, it's very universal. I would say the, the same code can be used for uh, other synchronous signals generation. Up to probably 33 megahertz is probably the limit. So I used it last year to generate sync on, on VGA color. And two years ago on radio frequency signal generation. One thing that you have to take into account is that the DAC has no linear transfer function and this is where the value of this load resistor uh, plays a role. For each value you have to generate this curve and when you prepare the table with values you have to take that into account. So if I do that, this is a picture from the scope of this sine wave. Echo recording module has three subunits. There's a digitizer, there's a buffer for the digitized envelope, and there's an iterator node that controls the whole module. The digitizer is based on the analog uh, node, and this is the transfer function for the ADC. And you can see that the transfer function is linear between 750 and 1300 millivolts. So that's the reason why I've chosen the virtual ground as 750, and so the positive half wave of the signal is uh, converted correctly. The negative is not, but I don't use the negative half wave anyway. So this is the actual trace recorded at the input of the analog node when an echo is coming. And this is how it looks like when it's digitized by that node. So you see that the vertical axis is inverted, so the more positive voltage, the lower the value from the ADC. And this is the baseline. So as I said, the negative half waves are distorted. But it's not an issue. This digitized data are then sent to the next node, and it has two functions. First, it measures baseline before any echo comes, so I know what is the baseline level. And second, it pass, passes the, the digitized signal through exponential moving average filter just to remove occasional glitches and, and spikes. I don't use any other filter in this application. Then there's the, the envelope node, and this node does a lot of things. It's, it initiates a conversion upon this trigger signal that goes to the GPIO pin. It removes direct sound wave. When you send the, the ping, the receivers, they, they can hear it, even before first echo comes. So it removes this wave. It, oh, sorry. It detects positive half waves, finds the maxima, inverts those values. There is some subsampling that takes place, and the algorithm is self-synchronizing. And I will explain how it works on this picture. So this is the incoming wave. Now the vertical axis is voltage, so this is the positive half wave. And the algorithm keeps a value threshold that's slightly above the baseline. And suppose we start with this sample. Now, the code has three loops. In the first loop, I read 25 samples. By the way, there's a 50 samples in one period. So I read 25 samples, find the maximum, and that's the data point for the envelope. Then, there's another loop, but it has two conditions to finish. Either it takes 25 samples, or it finds sample that's negative, and in this case it's the first one. The third loop comes that has, that has to read either 24 samples or find sample that's above the threshold. And in this case, it ends here. And the algorithm considers the next sample as the new starting point. Now, the aim of this algorithm is not to start at the baseline or close to baseline, but at the beginning of the positive half wave, so I can easily with that first loop find the maximum. Due to phase shift, it may happen that I start late. I take 25 samples, find the maximum, that's okay. The second loop looks for the negative value, that's this one. And the third loop ends earlier because it, because it finds value about the threshold. And so I again start at the beginning of the positive half wave. The opposite situation, we start too early. I take 25 samples, find the data point, then I start the next loop, and it reads samples until I am here in the negative voltage. And I start the third loop looking for the value of threshold, 
And if it's not found, it's not a problem, this is the next starting point. And again, I start at the beginning of positive halving. This is much simpler algorithm than using filters. Filters require multiplications, but here I just compare values. <laughs> There's a fourth situation when, when they have no signal. There's a noise. This wouldn't work, this algorithm. And what I really need, I need to keep the pace. I need to have approximately 50 samples per one data point because I'm using the, the distance, the number of data points as a, as a distance measure. So I start here, take 25 samples. This is some data point close to the, uh, the baseline. Then I look for negative value. And here I have to wait several samples until randomly I have a negative voltage. And the last loop takes 24 samples because threshold is set above the noise level. And I start here. So if you see, it's the sample 51, not 50. But that error is negligible compared to what I mentioned. And so it works also when there's a noise. So all situations, situations are covered. And uh, the digitized envelope has 256 points. The resolution is 8 bits, so I can stack it, uh, stack it in, in two nodes. And actually, this is using Greg's uh, delay line. It's modified, so that is circular buffer, meaning that this control node either reads data from the digitizer or it reads data from the output node. When I read data from the buffer, I write them back to the buffer, and I can do it several times. And the reason for doing this is that the algorithm used for processing data is iterative, and it has to go several times through the same envelope. These blue arrows, they actually control whether I read new data or I provide the old data. And this blue arrow is controlled from this iterator node. So it controls circular buffer, it counts iterations, and it also reads, it, it pulls the right port so when there's a request for new data, it provides it. And that's the echo recording module, and we are at the first demonstration. Oops. What you see here are two traces. Green is the right channel, red is the left channel. And for the purpose of this demo, there's half of this direct of this direct sound wave at the beginning, at the left. Now, if I place an obstacle here, you can see signal in both uh, on both sides, on both channels, roughly the same uh, the same intensity. But during the travel, the head gets somehow misaligned, so it will not be exact. Now, if I place something to the left and closer to this detector, you see that the left channel in, in red is very intense compared to the right channel. And similarly, if I place something to the right, yeah, the green is much higher. Actually, it saturates already. And similarly, I can remove them, and they go away. The refresh rate is approximately 14 Hz, but it's controlled by the Conifers application. It just waits and then sends another impulse. It could be much faster. So that was the first part. Now, eco processing. Eco processing takes place in those two modules. And before I delve into details, I have to refresh, at least for myself, it was a lot of refreshment, refresh some mathematical concepts. So the first one is that of normal distribution. The probability density function of normal distribution is defined by two variables, mean and variance. And using that equation, 
we can generate this bell-shaped curve. Now, there is one important point. This equation does not provide probability. The value is probability density. Probability as such is the area below that curve on a certain interval. So you need to integrate that. However, for discrete data and for integer x values, we can approximate it by this rectangle. And if the width of this rectangle is 1, then the area is numerically the same as the probability density. So for this case, we can equate probability and value provided by this uh, Gauss equation. The second concept is that of Gaussian mixture model. And that's the, the central part of the algorithm. <clears throat> the Gaussian mixture model assumes that the signal we receive, the amplitude envelope, is a mixture of Gaussians, of, of K Gaussians. Now, the amplitude is therefore the weighted sum of Gaussians, and the weighting factor alpha is called mixing coefficient. The number of Gaussians, the value for alpha, mu, and sigma squared, are unknown in this model, and they are called hidden variables, and collectively they are denoted theta. Now, the aim is to find values for those hidden variables. And there are several approaches. The most sim simple is that we assume there is a set of Gaussians that have the same alpha, the same variance, and only mu is evenly distributed along the x, uh, x axis. And there's an iterative process that successively optimizes those values to find the, the, the most likely values. And there's the third concept, that expectation maximization algorithm. So it finds maximum likelihood theta. It works in two steps. The first step is so-called E step. It calculates the posterior probability of theta given the x. x is actually our observed data and it uses Bayes' theorem. In the end step, we then use the updated, the, the theta, well, we update the theta based on the posterior probability. In other words, we want to know if we have some initial values for alpha and k and, and, and mu sigma. We want to know how likely is that model describing our data. And iteratively, we improve that estimation. So the formulas we have to use are, first we have to normalize data, because the amplitude envelope in this model is considered a probability density function, and as such, the sum of the, of the, the area under the envelope is equal to 1. Then in each step, we calculate so-called responsibility uh, factor, or ratio, and that's basically the product of probability multiplied by this alpha and divided by the sum of all probabilities. In other words, it says at the given point how much this particular Gaussian contributes to the observed data. And the third step, M step, is just calculating the, uh, the estimates of, of those variables. This is straightforward calculation, but it's too complex for GA144. So I wanted to simplify that somehow. <laughs> Chuck is frowning at me. <laughs> it is complex in the sense that it takes a lot of resources and it's not necessary for this particular application. So, how to simplify that? First of all, I found out that I don't need to normalize data. If I don't do, then alpha is not from 0 to 1, but from 0 to the area below that curve, below that element. And that has one positive side effect. Alpha j is then area below the j's Gaussian. Now, uh, for calculating the azimuth to the object, those two students, they used ratio of amplitude. Here I use ratio of uh, areas, because it's more robust. So I need those alphas to calculate the azimuth. Next, the biggest problem for me was how to do this. Because recall that for calculating the Gauss probability, you need exponential function, you need square root, and all those can be implemented in F18 computer, and Chuck did so. And it's nice code, but for my taste, it's not, 
it's, it's really not necessary for this application. So I said, okay, something simpler, lookup table. So the question is whether I can have Gaussian in lookup table. Gaussian is nice curve, it's symmetric, so I, it's only enough to keep half of that, of that function in the table. Second, if you change uh, mu, the mean, it just shifts Gaussian along the x-axis. So again, it's one table. But the problem is with sigma. Changing sigma changes the shape of Gaussian. And so I would have to, to have one table for each sigma value. And the question is how many sigma values I need. What's the spread of sigma values in my application? And I did this experiment. So I measured full width of those peaks at half, half, half maximum of the peak. And that's often used in, in chromatography. And the, the underlying Gaussian, the sigma, is then related by this equation. And what I found that regardless, regardless the height of the peak, the sigma is something between 5 and 7. And there's no trend uh, with respect to the height of the peak. So I said, let's try with just one value. Let's use 6, and that's my value. I need only one lookup table. Doing this simplification, I could scratch completely that terrible equation, <laughs> so I don't need to calculate sigma square. And this is finally simplified calculation. In one step, I calculate this responsibility ratio, and in the other step, I just update those two values. So this is the module that does so, and it's composed of 12 subunits, and they are completely same, the same. The subunits are called the GML calculator, and they have three nodes. In the first node, there's a lookup table, and what you can see here, this is uh, the boot, up des boot descriptor, and this, uh, this number here is the, the initial mean for this particular normal table. So that's the only difference between calculators. Each one starts at different position. Then this is the table, and it holds 25 data points. Now, sigma is equal to 6, so I cover roughly 4 sigma from the mean. And if you have an uh, idea, at 4 sigma, the Gaussian the function value is almost 0. It never reaches 0. But in this case, I simplify again, and I said, okay, if it's far away, then for sigma, just plug zero in. Uh, the format here is a fractional number, using 16 bits as a fractional part. And this is the code. The code is simple. There's a loop of 256 cycles. In each cycle, I read the, the parameter of this cycle from the return stack, and this is my x value. The code always keeps new value on top of stack. So if I call p, then the p just calculates the probability. It calculates the difference and finds it in the table, and that's what's returned. And using the store b, I send this probability to the next node. There's, oh, there is also an outer loop of 10 cycles, and this is because I use 10 iterations. And after each iteration, I read back the updated mean value. And since it stays on the stack, I can go like that all the time. The next node calculates this responsibility ratio. <clears throat> uh, this is simple multiplication. That's not a problem. The problem is it needs some of those products from all nodes, all 12 calculators. So they have to communicate somehow between each other. And they do it this way. The normal table calculates the part, uh, probability for the particular x point, and then it sends it to the Gauss ratio node. The probability is uh, duplicated, and a partial sum is created, and it's, it goes completely to the left, where I have some of all those products. And then I send them back and make a local copy in each node. So it's kind of shuttle, left and right, and now I have the, the correct values in, in all calculators, and they can be used to calculate the ratio. This is the code. First of all, there's a variable to keep value of alpha in each uh, calculator. Then there's some arithmetic works for fractional multiplication and divisions. 
RJ, this word actually does what you've seen in this animation. And again, there is a loop of 256 cycles. And in this loop, we read probability, we calculate the RJ, and uh, the output is, uh, yeah, the RJ, sure. And it's sent to the other node by this uh, story. There's again an outer loop of 10 cycles, and after each iteration, I read back two values, updated mu and updated alpha. Alpha is kept in this variable, and mu is sent to the normal table. And last thing to calculate is alpha and mu. Now, notice that the denominator here is actually alpha. The code has two variables to keep the sums of those products, and Again, 256 cycles loop, where I get R from the Gauss ratio node. I calculate those two products. Y is the, the, the E intensity of the signal at the particular X point. And I accumulate those products in these two variables. At the end, after, all, uh, after the iteration goes through all points, I calculate mu as the product of those two sums, and I have alpha. Now, they are duplicated and sent back to update my model. And they are also collected and sent out of the echo processing module. So actually, I get data after each iteration, but nine of them are discarded, and I just take the last one. This is for uh, testing purposes. Something about timing. One iteration takes 1.24 microseconds. That was measured by, by scope. Yeah. Calculating mu and alpha then takes 61 microseconds. And since I have 256 data points, the whole, iter the whole process takes like less than 400 microseconds. I have 10 iterations. So within 10 millisecond, uh, 4 milliseconds, I localize the, the objects in front of the sensor. Now, it takes 8 milliseconds to receive the signal, the ultrasonic signal. So actually, this is faster than the information I get from, uh, from these echoes. Pretty fast, I would say, for my, for my uh, purpose. Second demonstration. the same traces and you will see also updated Gaussians on those traces. Now I remove this uh, direct sound wave so it's not there at the beginning anymore. So placing an object I get the, those Gaussians and I will try to stop it and hope, hopefully you can see yeah, these fit traces are Gaussians that were calculated. The fit trace is the sum, so it shows how good is the fit. And you may say, okay, this is not really good. I agree, that's just proof of concept. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, so that's the, the output of this uh, echo processing module. And if I place other objects, it works the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are not there yet. <laughs> Third part of the implementation is about azimuth and distance calculation. Now, data, what you've seen, those Gaussians, the information is transferred to the host chip, and here I do some post-processing. So this is a picture similar to the demo, and it looks fine until you have a look at the, at the order of data as they are received. So in red, you have left channel, in green, right channel. The first column is the mu value, the mean position of that Gaussian. 
At the right column is the area. Now, there are some things that are not really nice. First, we have these empty pairs. Those two zeros, they represent Gaussians from the model that were not used. We start with 12 Gaussians, but if we, if we need less, they are simply replaced by two, zero, two zeros. So that have to be removed. Also, normally, the values in this first column should be increasing. But sometimes you find this out of order value. And the reason is that the model is blind. It doesn't know that it should be... Well, when I start, the initial new values are really in increasing order. But during the iterations, it may happen that one Gaussian moves left, the other right, and this is the, the result. So I have to put that in order. Also, sometimes it happens that two Gaussians try to interpret one peak. As in this case, I don't know whether you can see, there are two Gaussians in, in purple. And they simply try to fit data of one peak. So these have to be merged. And that's, those three things are the task for post-processing model. This module has three subunits. One that's called sieves. The other is node that removes these empty pairs. And last, there's the merger. The sieve implements a sorting algorithm. Now, there are many sorting algorithms, like bubble sort and quick sort and you name it. The problem is that all those algorithms require to read data from memory and to store them back to memory and you need indexing uh, registers. And doing this in one F18 computer is too much for my taste. So I said, okay, let's take it from the other side. I have only 12 data, 12 data pairs. So I take 12 nodes. And each node will hold one data pair. Up. Yeah, the name comes from sieve analysis. Sieve analysis uses a set of sieves of different mesh size and stacks them together with the largest opening sieve on top. And if you place, for instance, a sand or whatever your material and shake the whole stack, what you get is this. You get fractions uh, based on the size of those stones. And the same is implemented here. These are actually pairs taken from the picture, from the table, from the left channel. So there's a mu, and this is the area. And I read those pairs in the order they come. And each node takes the value, and then the second is compared. If it's less or equal to the mu that's already on the node, it's passed downstream. But if it's greater, it replaces them. And so simply I send those pairs and they either skip the line or replace the line, the, the node at the particular place where it belongs to. And at the end the data is ordered. I love your graphic. <laughs> Thank you. I love to do it. And that's the result. So now we have zero pairs at the beginning and then the order is correct. This empty uh, removal node just removes those zero pairs, but now we are losing uh, track of how long the sequence is. We had 12 pairs, now it may be different, so I have to put flag at the end. And minus one is the uh, best one because I have never negative values in those uh, data. Then the merger. Merger receives the sequence like that, this area and mean for the first peak and so on. It splits. The data stream, the area goes through the wire node to the node that's called weighted, and the means are sent to the merger node. Here, simple comparison is done. If those two means are closer to each other than six, one sigma, then they are considered as being uh, describing one peak. So I send them to the weighted node, and I calculate the weighted average, and the weighted factor being the area. And this weighted average is then sent back to merger. And area is summed up. So now it looks like I have read only one pair. And I read another one and do the comparison again and again. In case that the difference is greater than one sigma, then I simply send those first, the, this first pair out. And that's the result. I remove the zero pairs, 
And this 146, you may remember there was 144, uh, uh, 148, so they are now merged together. The picture is still the same, by the way. Okay, now we have left channel, right channel pairs. And by looking at this, you can already compare what are peaks corresponding to one object. So in the first case, 50 and 49 mu, the difference is negligible. These two peaks correspond to one object. Then there is an object that's too much to left, so I have no signal on the right, and so on. Visually, it's easy, but GA144 has to do it. And so I have this matchmaker node uh, module. It reads the data from left and right channel. Extend the node, just supplies data when the, the stream is exhausted. Because now I have two streams of different number of uh, pairs. So I have to somehow supply data. Part of this module is here in Matchmaker node. So it compares the absolute difference of those two M values, and if it's again less than one sigma, then this is arbitrary value. If it's less than that, it simply assumes it's one peak in this echo. It calculates the average of those two M values and sends out this triplet, mean, left channel area, right channel area. However, if this difference is greater, then it selects the smaller of the, the M values, so it selects the right channel, sends out this M value, the corresponding area, and supplements the other area with zero. So I have either M from left channel, A from L ch L ch left channel, and zero, or the other way around. And that's the result. In yellow, you can see mu values, left channel areas, right channel areas. Now we can compare areas and calculate the azimuth. And that's done in this last node. The azimuth is calculated as the ratio of difference and sum of those areas. And this is called Michelson contrast. I took this approach from the technical report I, I mentioned at the beginning. It has nice properties for signal for situation when there's signal only in the left channel, the value is minus one. And for only right channel signal, I have the value uh, for azimuth plus one. If the area on both channels is the same, the, the value of azimuth is zero, and this is proportional to tangens the, uh, theta. And since the distance is proportional to mu, I have both distance and azimuth calculated for all objects that the sensor can see. Now there are many things you can do with that, because there's a lot of space, so I can create a map builder and with each updated scan, I can update the lab. What's handy, the host chip is connected to the SRAM on the evaluation board, so that would be really easy to use the SRAM as map. Since I'm talking about application in robots, you can implement motor control here, and if you remember three years ago, my first presentation about BID control for, for uh, motors, suggested to use these two controllers on the right edge of host chip to control differential drive of the motor. And I can imagine to implement a path planner since we not only see the angle to the object but also distance. So at least for the short trace, we can, the robot can plan the path, how to avoid those obstacles. However, in the last demonstration, I just send those pairs, distance and azimuth, back to the colorful application, and you will see something like radar screen. Now it takes some time to load because uh, it's rather really huge code. So this is a radar screen, and if I place an object here, you see the trace. And the table and the values up are mu, so the distance, this is the area, and there's the azimuth. So 
it oscillates between minus and plus values. It's, it's roughly at the central axis. Now there's a lot of noise, and uh, well, as I said, it's just proof of concept. It has to be improved. Now if I place another object to the right, well, it's there. And similarly, I may place. Oh, sorry, that was to the left. And I may say, I place one to the right, and it's there. So a shadow. I'm oh, sorry. Make a shadow. Sorry. But one make a shadow. Shadow. Um, one in front behind the other. other one. Yeah. Oh yeah, I tried that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, there are inherently things that you cannot see with uh, ultrasonic detection. First is what you said, and second, if you place two objects at the same distance but different angle, they are apparently one object in front of you, and that's the biggest. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry? If they're far enough apart? Yes, exactly. And that's the biggest obstacle, because the robot thinks, oh, there's an object in front of me, but in actu actually, in reality, there are two on the sides. But if you have a map, then... Okay. Yes. Right. Using map is one of the possibilities. Also, if you look what bats are doing, they are turning their head. And turning head helps them to find this uh, catch. Yeah, probably. I <laughs> notice that there's a third artifact. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, is that caused by a reflection or is that contraction? Yeah, first thing. Uh, the radar covers only half of the range so that you can see the, the, the spots that are too close to the sensor. But the table shows whole range, so there were sometimes. Uh, noise interpreted as a, as a signal. And also, I, I don't set any uh, threshold. So if there is a noise and it's interpreted as a peak, you would see it. And second thing, often this noise is only in one channel. So you see it too to the right or too much to the left. So that's probably a way how to distinguish that. Uh, um, if, if you had an object that had a, 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 like a, a concave curve, would it focus and appear a false image? Yeah, this is again one product of ultrasonic obstacle detection. If you have specular reflection, you can completely de uh, deviate the signal and don't see anything. There are, I'm almost at the end, there are some possible developments. So immediate improvement is larger receptive field. That's one thing. Uh, I use 60 degrees, but I don't believe 60 degrees is what, what the sensor is capable of, so perhaps 30 degrees is fine, and then I lose signal from one channel, and therefore I don't know whether it's this to the left or much more to the left. Wide angle ultrasonic transducer is a uh, simple solution, but much interesting solution is to add pinnae or artificial oracles to those sensors. The same way bats have their oracles. Range. The first thing that has to be improved is this uh, receiver amplifier. It has fixed gain, and already at this distance of one meter, I cannot see this, uh, this marker. If I place this marker close to the sensor, there's so much overshoot that it blocks the, the application. There's an over overflow. However, a variable gain receiver amplifier would solve this problem, and there's one very nice thing. All analog nodes on GA144 have analog output and also analog input. So if I use input for the signal, I can use analog output to control the gain of this amplifier, so just to generate voltage trap or something like that. Uh, another thing, if I increase range, I would need more GMM calculators. Here I'm limited by the number of nodes, but I can imagine using just one chip for one channel and double the number of nodes easily. Yeah, a stronger thing is easy, just more cycles and you get stronger signal. There's one thing, Gaussian is just approximation of the shape of this, this uh, echo, because if you have a larger number of cycles in this pink, 
then you see it's rather double exponential. It goes up and then it goes down. For short signals, Gaussian can be used. For longer signal, I probably have to use uh, some asymmetric function, but mixed models can be de derived for asymmetric functions as well. So it is in principle possible. There are other potential areas of interest playing with ultrasonic detection. One of them is uh, detection of moving objects. Doppler shift is quite a simple uh, thing to be implemented. And comparing Doppler shift from left and right channel, I think I should be able to estimate the, the direction of the moving object. Very important thing, now, if you are dealing with mobile robots, it's okay just to have horizontal uh, resolution. But if you think about robots like drones, they need vertical obstacle detection as well. And the question is how to do it. One thing that I like very much is do it the same way as bats do. And they use, instead of constant frequency signal, they use a frequency sweep. And uh, the pinnae, the auricles, they have special wrinkles and they function as uh, frequency filters. And it was found that changing the elevation, you change the notch in, in the spectrum of, of uh, these frequencies. And you can estimate the elevation of the object. So that would be really great to implement in GNR44. And also, bats are really great in uh, estimating size, shape, and surface roughness. And this would be also interesting to see whether we can do it artificially. And there are papers describing how to do it. Finally, I'd like to thank those scientists who allowed me to show the video of bats. I, I find them, I mean, those videos very interesting. Uh, my thank to Michael Kuhlman for allowing reproducing from his paper and for discussions we had about his work. Um, very Greg and Green Arrays for providing me evolution boards and for countless discussions we had. Well, it's always QA session. I have questions and he has to answer, and he, he really answers, so I learned a lot. And last but not least, I thank Chuck Moore not only for inventing fourth, but for allowing, allowing me to see his uh, code for F18 computers, and that's a great source of knowledge. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, the question is whether what I think about possible industrial applications monitoring uh, assembly lines, for instance. Well, the more cluttered is the environment, the more difficult it is to really identify what are actual objects and what are reflections. But in principle, I think it should be possible. Yeah. Yes. So those videos that you showed early on, they're like hundreds of bats. So I'm like wondering if you thought about uh, what would happen with uh, you know, where these uh, uh, sonic Yeah, the, the video, actually, the, the, those two scientists, they say there are hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of bats leaving that uh, Carlos Bart covers. Uh, there's definitely a lot of jamming when all guys are trying to, to see what's around. But uh, to tell the truth, first of all, they also can see. Not great vision, but they can see. And second, they are really hitting each other. But those, uh, those clashes, those uh, crashes, they are not really critical. So they can live with that. That's part of their of the navigation, just touch to each other. As far as, as far as jamming is concerned, there are the, the Dr. Corcoran did a lot of studies where insects can jam bats sonar. Mm -hmm. They can generate things, they can generate signals that are similar like echoes. And just these are false echoes. So yeah, that's very interesting. And also bats can do that to each other just when they are competing for a prey. did a lot of work with 
this 20 years ago and I actually built a similar system. Um, it, I'm talking about one sonar, I wasn't working on triangulation. So, um, if you, if, if you can, you know how you have the two blocks that were been doing all of the, the peak detection and averaging? You can do that in your op amp. So, basically, you, uh, you have the op amp that amplifies the, the receiver, and then you put a diode on the output, and then you put a, a, a resistor, and then a cap, and then another bleed resistor, and you tune that circuit, and you're going to get on the input of your ADC the average under the curve of the of the 40 kilohertz. Yeah, I see. Actually, what you describe is a harder approach to this problem. So do right. those things come with the amplitude envelope using uh, using those op-amps? I'm a software guy. That's the reason why my hardware is really basic. <laughs> and uh, my intention is always to do everything on chips. So, but I agree. With that, you know, well, what I was thinking of is you pull all that processing out, and then you can put all your mapping, all your other higher levels. Oh, you're right. Yeah. yeah. If, if the number of nodes is, is limitation for a, a real application, then of course something has to be moved away to the hardware. And that's always a question of uh, trade-offs. And one more recommendation to you. <laughs> um, I did a lot of research on pinging the, the transmitter as well. So what I used to do is I do one ping, two pings, four pings, eight pings, and it seemed to get maximum power, acoustical power, somewhere between 20 and, uh, this is 20-year-old memory here, <laughs> but between 20 and 32, um, so what happens there is it allows you to see things up really close with one ping mm -hmm. and really far away with 32. Okay, I see. So the variable number of cycles in a ping can help uh, in resolution. So short pings for close objects and, and long pings right. for far away objects. Yeah, as I said, this is a proof of concept. That can sure. I'm just trying to help. Yeah, the, the, definitely interesting information for me. Also. Uh, you've seen that I generate sign uh, signal. Uh, it's not necessary. Basically, you can do a square wave. First of all, it was fun for me to find out how to do it. And second, I guess it needs less energy. Because if you do a uh, square wave, the energy is lost as a heat in this ultrasonic uh, transducer. They are quite good uh, filters. So I think... I, I draw with a square wave. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what's usually done using square wave. There's a technique where, where the, um, not, not a pain, but a chirp, where it's a series of frequencies that goes up. How does that work with something that you would, um, how would that work in a measurement system that you're proposing? Actually, to generate a chirp, or anything that's not fixed frequency, requires thinking about the clock. I have one megahertz clock, and I read 50 data points to generate one period of sign signal. Now with that resolution, that's the only thing I can do with the resolution. So if I want to generate a smooth uh, frequency sweep, I have to find something else. Oh, so for instance, varying the, the clock frequency or something like that. The other thing is, um, were, were you modifying your Gaussian table as, as you go? This, this, this table of fixed numbers. No, I don't modify that. Because the, yeah, the only thing I need to do I said that the sigma is fixed, and then I just stretch it to cover the area. Yes, please. The comment about the uh, chirps remind me of something. <clears throat> I don't know what bats do, but whales actually have different types of sonar that they use for different ranges that they're doing. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that whales use different kinds of sonars. Uh, I was most focused on that. <laughs> Okay, any other question? Greg? Right. Yeah. Do you have 10 megahertz available? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're right. If I used 10 megahertz just from the clock, then I have 10 times higher resolution, and I could do this with That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one, one last comment on the chirping. I, I'm not looking at the data sheet, but these transducers are tuned to 40 kilohertz. Yes. So they, so they fall off 
Um, I don't remember how what their bandwidth was, but last fight was one kill, as I guess if I'm not wrong. Something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, for frequency speed that, that cannot be used. I, I would have to use something else. Unless you use groups of 40 kilohertz, that, that might be interesting. You know, 40 kilohertz and then a dead zone, like maybe you do 10 of them, and then a dead zone of 10, and then you play around with the, the width. Very, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yes? My first project before used ultrasonic sensors to monitor hip tilts as a way to drive wheelchairs. 35 years ago. Okay. Oh, that was just a note. That's not a question. Right. <laughs> well, actually, the, the research on ultrasonic obstacle detection uh, in bed like obstacle detection is from 80s and 90s. Uh, there's a lot of papers on, on this. So it's not, it's not new by any means. I'm very surprised at the the, uh, the Cooker and Bat video of, of the of Bat getting the, the insect at a certain point. He gave up with his sonar and just wrapped the insect with his wings and essentially fell out of the sky while he ate it. I guess. Correct, correct. That's the way they do it. They localize the insect by sending chirps that are uh, far apart. When they spot an insect, they increase they decrease the interval between different chirps and when they are approaching, there's something, I, I forgot how it's called, there's something, the chips are really a uh, continuous signal, and when they are sure where the insect is, they just stop and grab it. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes they, they miss, of course. Yes? Um, I have a question about the airplanes with their distance measuring equipment send double chirps, little, little double pulses to help disambiguate coming back. Do you guys think of that? Uh, not when I did this application, but when I read those papers related to ultrasonic detection, there are other things how to improve precision and accuracy. One of them is this. Uh, as far as I know, radar is using some, I mean, the true radar, not, not the ultrasonic. It uses some other techniques, and there are techniques that you don't send only chirp, you send a code. And the code is, I forgot the name, but you can correlate it with itself and, and therefore find exactly the position. The precision of that work was like one millimeter in distance and one degree uh, of angle. But I thought that for robot navigation, you don't need that, that great precision. You just measure it several times and say, okay, approximately somewhere here. Uh, my approach is more like, like nature does. Like when, when nature does something, it's, it's good enough, and, and that's it. But you're right. Yeah, can be improved. Okay, thank you.